Hello. Um, so this is chapter 41 in your AP biology textbook. It's also in your ECE. Um, there's going to be about 10 different systems that we are going to look at. If we're not just going to look at the systems, we're going to look at the evolutionary chart of those systems, like different levels of animals. I don't like to use the word levels because no animal is actually trying to become a human being, but just for, you know, Laverty purposes, gravity purposes, we're just going to use the word levels. At different levels of organization, different animals have different ways of uh, digesting material. So we're going to look at that. And it's not just for digestion. We'll look at everything from respiratory system to my personally hated system, the immune system. Um, so this will be about six to seven videos. I don't know exactly how much. If I get into a monologue, it'll be a lot. Um, six to seven videos. And at the end of each video, there'll be one or two questions for you to answer. There'll be more like essay questions, so you'll answer them. Make sure I get them before school starts. It'll be on Jupiter, don't worry. If I can figure this out, I would be in business, wouldn't I? Okay. Um, so. For an animal to do its everyday functions, it needs a certain amount of energy. Energy it comes in the form of ATP. ATP is produced by the mitochondria. Now, we will do this more in detail when we talk about cellular respiration, um, but for, for all intensive purposes here, um, it's just that. ATP is produced by the mitochondria. Glucose molecule goes into the mitochondria. There are different types of um, breaking down of my glucose molecules that takes place. There's an anaerobic way of doing it, anaerobic respiration. There's an aerobic respiration. There's fermentation. There's different methods of doing it. Um, they get, fermentation does not take place in the, it takes place in the cytoplasma. Um, and you get for every glucose molecule, you're going to land up getting anywhere from 28 to 36 ATP. And that ATP is the one that powers all the cellular processes in, uh, in the body. So again, in the beginning of the class, thanks. In the beginning of the class, we'll talk about how there are different organic building blocks of this, uh, of the human body of, of any organism for that matter. Um, you need carbon, Hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen to basically are the building blocks of proteins, carbohydrates, uh, proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids. And once you have these uh, basic building blocks, the body can build and make its own. There are a lot of amino acids that the body will make itself. There are some amino acids that has to come from the diet. Um, there are certain proteins and vitamins, well, there's vitamins and cofactors that has to come from outside. That means you have to consume it in the form of food. Some things your body will make themselves and we'll go into more detail as we go along. I somehow cannot figure out this. Uh, there are basically four classes of essential nutrients. There are essential amino acids. So let's look at essential amino acids. There are a total of 20 amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. Uh, there are tw 20 of them, totally 20 of them. Nine of them are considered to be essential. That means your body cannot make it. You have to consume it from um, outside. So it has to come in the form of food, whether you eat a piece of beef, you eat a piece of chicken, you know, shrimp, or whatever, or lentils also. One of the more important amino acid that is an essential amino acid is methionine, and methionine is the starting amino acid for every single eukaryotic protein. If you look at a protein chain, if you open the, the protein up, the first amino acid in that would be methionine. Another one is uh, phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is one of the more important uh, pre uh, amino acids required to make uh, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, so your flight and fight syndrome and all of that. Then 11 of those are considered to be non-essential. Non-essential amino acids are amino acids that regardless of you eating, it, eating providing the body from an outside source, your body makes it. So there is a biosynthesis process of taking um, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon and synthesize, biosynthesizing them and making them into those amino acids. The nine essential ones, not so much. Um, the, no, the non-essential ones, yes. 
<clears throat> for example, one of the non-essential amino acids is glutamic acid. Glutamic acid is a, plays a vital part in making proteins that are required to synthesize DNA, RNA, and then eventually make proteins. So this is a very high demand uh, amino acid and the body basically makes its own. Um, you also have the next there is a, within the non-essential and the essential class, there is something called as conditional amino acids, something like proline and lysine. These guys, lysine is from the essential group and proline is from the non-essential group. These guys, they're usually synthesized by the body, like proline is usually synthesized by the body when you're sick, when you're in a stressful situation, when the body is under some kind of stress. Now, do I require you to know all the amino acids? Not really. Uh, I'll torture you with that when we do the uh, RNA synthesis and, you know, transcription translation chapter. But I do want you to know some, um, uh, pay attention to methionine. Methionine is going to like, you know, it's going to keep coming up. And then you have something called vitamins. Everybody knows what vitamins are. Um, vitamins play a very essential role. In the next slide, I'm going to talk about that in terms of what, how an enzyme functions. You also have minerals. Minerals play the role of cofactors. They're also a part of the enzyme. And I think I have an image I want to talk about. So there are 20 amino acids um, essential. Okay, if you look at this image right here, let's just, this it's a very rudimentary image of an enzyme. All of you know what an enzyme does. Substrate is what attaches to it for about, it's like a reactant, right? So let's assume that this is a, lact a lactose molecule and this is a lactase enzyme. This active site here that you see that the, the place where the substrate attaches itself is substrate specific. It is going to be specific. So lactase is going to be specific to the lactose molecule. Right adjacent to that is a place for a coenzyme. This co So if there is no, let's assume that there is no lactose in your system. So in order to inactivate this enzyme, this coenzyme just comes off. Once that coenzyme comes up, this shape is disrupted. Once the shape is disrupted, this enzyme is basically inactive. So coenzymes, vitamins act as coenzymes. So they aid and help the enzymes to work better. Cofactors also pre um, predominantly do the same, same job of ma maintaining the shape and maintaining um, the integrity of the enzyme itself. But cofactors are usually minerals. Uh, it could be iron, it could be calcium, it could be a whole bunch of uh, like different things. Those would be cofactors. Coenzymes are organic molecules. Cofactors, not necessarily, actually not. So here's the list of all your... Um, different types of vitamins that you need that are fat soluble and water soluble and um, vitamins water soluble uh, vitamins usually if you take too much of it you'll have really expensive pee for example if you take a lot of vitamin b because you're feeling bad your body will use what it's supposed to use and the rest of it you'll pee it out same thing with vitamin c um however a d e and k are fat soluble so they actually are stored under your um uh, skin in the form uh, in fat molecules like if you eat a lot of vitamin a your your skin will actually look orange you could try it at home and don't try it once school begins so i can see it and laugh um vitamin k is a very very important factor because it allows for blood clotting it is found a lot in green vegetables and uh tea it's also made very symbiotically with the um, e. coli and the different flora and fauna that lives in your gut, they also provide it. It is a vit vital, um, vitamin, vital vitamin, okay. Here's a list of all the minerals that your body needs. The, your body actually needs it in a very small amount. Um, you could actually have, if you ate too much calcium, if you ate too much phosphorus, if you ate too much iron, it actually does, is actually toxic to your body. Um, so the first, the ne previous, this slide and the previous slide kind of go over it, like learn it. I mean, if you ex want to explain to me what a dairy product and a dark green and legumes are, we have bigger problems than this chapter. Um, as we go along through the year, we'll talk more and more about how what hemoglobin does what pro what's the role of hemoglobin what's the role of magnesium magnesium is 
a super important um, mineral because it is a huge part in the biosynthesis process. It, it's kind of the sequestering protein, um, the uh, mineral in a lot of different proteins. Um, iron is also a very important one because it is the one that is a sequestering, that sequesters oxygen and allows oxygen to, you know, be a part of hemoglobin and then it's transported across the body uh, to different cells. Can't figure why I can't do this. We usually hear a couple of words just thrown around malnutrition and undernutrition. These they don't really mean the same thing. A person can be obese and also can be malnourished. So malnourishment comes in when you are missing certain components in your diet. So you could be malnourished because you are not eating a lot of protein at all. So you're not getting the required amino acids. You are not getting the required iodine. You're not getting, so you could be malnourished, but if you have a steady diet of potatoes and rice, you'd be obese. Undernourishment is where you have the calorie level required for you to sustain is, is lower. You, if you're anorexic, you could be undernourished and also malnourished. Uh, in most like developing nations, we see a lot of problems with malnourishment may not be so much undernourishment. So in a, in a society that's predominantly eating uh, carbohydrates, you'll see a lot more malnourishment than you would see a lot more undernourishment. So one of the more important things about vitamins, a proper nourishment, malnourishment, its effects is on infants. So can a diet influence the frequency of birth defects? This study is actually looking at neural tube defects. That is the the, uh, the brain, the spinal cord, uh, the brain and the spinal cord. Usually pair um, females who are like extremely obese, who have uncontrolled, that where they haven't controlled their diabetes properly, um, have a very poor diet, have huge deficiencies in uh, folic acid. That's why if, like when, when you take your prenatal pill, Pills. don't take prenatal pills uh, when you take those they give you there's a huge amount of uh, folic acid in it so experimental group experimental group is the group that got the prenatal medication um, the instances of neural defects was 0.7 and the ones that did not did not get it 5.9 neural defects can be uh, can be as it can be very serious because your brain, your spinal cord has not fused together. So there's not a seamless flow of information. So spinal bifida, bifida is one of them. Neural defects can also be caused because um, you are having a lot of alcohol and on crack when the baby is being, you know, in vitro. Neural defects usually are caused in the mother even before she knows she's pregnant. So um, in the first few weeks of pregnancy, Um, so if you look at the basic structure of uh, digestion, uh, the first uh, first thing is ingestion, that is taking food in. Ingestion, um, ingestion can be divided into two. Let me go back. Let me go back. Okay. 